Good evening. Happy to meet you once again. And this evening we're talking about raising children for heaven. Raising children for heaven. And as I often do, I'm going to start with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our kind and loving Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the day, for your graces and your mercies. I thank you, Lord, for the reflections that I'm about to share. I pray, Lord, that they may be sanctified by your spirit. And if it were possible, Lord, if any of the words that I may say may not bring glory to you, please help me to forget them so that I may only say that which may bring glory to you. May this message be a blessing to someone. And may it lead someone to be closer to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So we are talking about raising children for heaven. I'm going to start with uh, a few scriptures before I share my personal testimony or my personal opinion as well on some of these things. So Psalms 127 verse 3 says, See, children are an heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. Children are an heritage for the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So children are a gift that God gives people. And I'd like to believe that from this verse we can conclude that God will require an account of all the parents. I don't think that um, when children end up in hell or end up lost let me put it that way god will not ask the parents where their children are i believe that when we all get to heaven if you've got children god is going to ask you where are the children that i've given you and you are going to have to give an account and god might require for you to prove as a parent that you've done everything that you can to make sure that you raise children for heaven but the children themselves have chosen a different way so that's at least uh, what i can preclude from this verse that tells us that children are a gift that god gives us the next text is first john 3 verse 18 which says my little children let us not love in word neither in tongue but in deed and in truth and you might be asking yourself but doesn't this verse talk about something different well i believe as parents there is a responsibility for us to love our children and to uh, be willing to do everything to make sure that we raise our children in the right way. And we are not to be just taking pictures and posting fancy pictures of beautiful children on social media so that people can think that we are blessed and we've got beautiful children. But God wants us to do our responsibility as parents and he wants us to take care of the little, little ones that he has given to us. And that is the setting in which I think that this verse is suitable for this message that we're speaking about. The final one is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, which says, Now no chastening or chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields peaceable, peaceable fruit of righteousness to them which are exercised thereby. So the reason why I came up with this topic is I had visited, uh, I had driven north to Limpopo to go for a funeral on Sunday and uh, a childhood friend's brother had passed away. And when I saw my friends, I thought of all the bad things that I used to do with them, of all the, the foolishness and all the unchristian things we used to do as children growing up. And I actually started thinking about how different maybe the world might have been if our parents had done a few things differently. And this is not a criticism of our parents, but I, I think I'm just talking about some of the blind spots and showing how we could do things differently and how I feel I could have benefited differently if my parents had done things differently. And I will share some of the things that I think they should have done differently. Um, but before we get there, I'd like to talk a bit about the brain, the human brain. The human brain is made up of all these parts. So the frontal lobe obviously is the very front part of the brain. And then uh, the, the medulla oblongata is the part that sits almost at the stem of the brain at the back. And 
this chart here shows all the different functions but i would like us to look at the most important function which is the frontal lobe which is what i want to talk a bit about before we get onto some of the tips that i want to share so it says that the frontal lobe is responsible for executive functions like thinking planning organizing problem solving emotions and behavioral control and personality so those are some of the things that are done by the frontal lobe and i would like to think that you would agree with me uh, in saying this is a really important function and then there's uh, the motor cortex which is important for movement so all the movement that you do all your muscles are connected to the motor cortex and then the sensory cortex is sensation and feeling and emotions and then sorry it's just sensation so touch and uh, all those things and then the parietal lobe is perception making sense of the world arithmetic and spelling so i found this uh this paper here or this website uh, the rochester university and their health encyclopedia talks about understanding the teen brain and i've snipped some things here that i want to share with you and i think my focus is going to be mostly teen, but these things can be applied for children of all ages. So it says here, understanding the teen brain, it does not matter how smart teens are or how well they score on the SAT or ACT test. So these are tests that uh, prove how smart children are. And these are tests that they write uh, to enter high school or university. I'm not from the US, but I know these are used in the US. And then it says good judgment is something they can excel in. Sorry, isn't something they can excel in, at least not yet. So as a teenager, good judgment is just something that is not possible. The rational part of the brain or the part that is responsible for reasoning, which is the frontal lobe, isn't fully developed and won't be until age 25 or so. I'd like you to keep this at the back of your mind as we continue today. So as a parent, you need to know that until at least your child turns 25, you are dealing with someone who is not fully uh, capable of reasoning for themselves, of weighing things, of judging things correctly, which means your children should be able to depend on you as a parent for issues of judgment. And sometimes your children might think you're being unfair. But the truth is, as we saw in Hebrews chapter 11, they will disagree with you when they are younger, but when they are older, they will actually thank you for having protected them from some of the things that they did not see because they could not see it. So it's almost as if the eyes for seeing such things have not yet developed in them. The paper continues to say, in fact, recent research has found that adult and teen brains work differently. Adults think with the prefrontal cortex, that part, the brain's rational part, and this is the part of the brain that responds to situation with good judgment and an awareness of long-term consequences. Teens, however, process information with the amygdala, and this is the emotional part of the brain. So teens think with their emotions, mostly. And then the last part says, in teens' brains, the connection between the emotional part of the brain and the decision-making part of the brain are still developing and not always at the same rate. That's why teens have overwhelming emotional input. They can't explain later what they were thinking. They weren't thinking as much as they were feeling. So teens are more stronger with their feelings than with their thinking. And I think this is important for parents to know because I see more and more Parents be trusting the judgment of young children. Parents trusting that their children will tell them the truth, that their children uh, will make the best decision. And I'm not saying that children should not be allowed to make decisions. I believe that the responsibility that children should get as they grow up should be incremental and that their judgment should be trained by parents by giving them responsibilities that are in line with the judgment that that person has already developed. So I'm by no means saying that parents should do all the thinking, but I'm saying parents should train their children being aware that their children are still developing their thinking and their frontal lobe will not fully form until at least age 25. So I've got some tips here. I think I've got eight tips 
of things that I wish had been done differently in my life. And I think these are things that might help other parents in uh, raising their children and things I hope to apply in my own life and raising my own children. So the first tip is already, as we've just seen, your children are not mini adults. So as parents, we should not think of our children as mini adults. We should not think that they're able to make the best decisions all the time. So if your child has friends, for instance, as a parent, you should not leave your child to choose friends that you think might be detrimental to your child's well-being and future. I mean, I used to have friends and didn't my mom never really cared about who I was with and what I was doing. And maybe that's unfair, but I mean, there were some friends that I had that were questionable and some of the things that I ended up doing in my life or some of the things I did without her knowledge, I did with people that she trusted. So I think my mom thought I was a media adult and maybe my mind is being biased. Maybe she did warn me about these things, but I do wish she had prevented me from seeing certain people. And I like this verse uh, in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, which says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that thou killest, thou that killest prophets and stonest those which are sent to thee. And then I like the part that I've highlighted in yellow. It says, How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hand gathereth her children under her wings, and ye would not. So God is using an analogy of a hen gathering her little ones under her, her, her wings. And I feel like it's the, the, the job of parents to gather their children close to them, to win the trust of their children, and to be able to read what's happening in their children's lives. Because there are so many things out there that are dangerous and detrimental to the children's well-being that parents are just not aware of, especially in the time that we're living in where there are so many distractions. I feel like parents have to be extra vigilant about where their children are, who they're with, and what they're doing. Because, like I said in the beginning, God is going to require an account of all the parents. When your children are lost, God is going to ask you. You're going to need to give an account. The second one is you need to be aware of the influence around your children. Here I'm thinking... If as a parent you know that your neighbor's kids are rowdy and well ill-behaved, you do not only have to tell your child to avoid such influence, but you also need to be stern about it. You need to tell your children they are not allowed to play with such children. I've seen parents who will say, yeah, those kids are bad, but if we're in the same neighborhood, I feel like as a parent, if you cannot avoid bad influences, if you're in a neighborhood that's bad for your child, it is better for you to move house and to change your, your location and to move to a more favorable location. I mean, I see people raising people, children in places like the city center where life is fast and there's people selling drugs and all the bad things are happening. And if you're not aware of your surroundings and the surroundings, the influence around your children, you will be allowing your children to be in danger, you will allow the devil to enter your home. I mean, one of the reasons why I say this is because my first exposure to pornography as a child was at the age 12, and it was at my neighbor's house, whose mother was a nurse, and um, no one would have suspected anything. And I guess, as, my, as, as I was saying, as a parent, you should have your frontal lobe formed. You should be able to preempt these things. You should be able to make sure that your children are always in spaces that are safe, where you can see them most of the time, and making sure that uh, your children are kept busy, being preoccupied by good things. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that as we continue. Number three, and I know this will be controversial, especially with the young people, but I do not understand why children have to date. And also, as I was growing up in, in the vendor culture, it was called taboo for young men and young women to play together. So why should your children play with the opposite sex or even date the opposite sex? What is the main aim of dating? I don't feel like uh, we need to practice uh, being comfortable around the opposite sex. I feel like that's something that God has built into every person. And you can get married having never kissed a girl and you should be okay. So I do not understand why Christian families are okay with their children dating, going out on dates 
and doing all the things that happen within this kind of dating environment. I mean, the truth is children end up becoming romantic and even having sex at a very young age because they are allowed to date. And I feel like the truth is in a Christian home, children should know that dating is not a game. It's not something that we do. The world might be okay with it. But the truth of the matter is when our children begin to date, we are exposing them to a whole lot that their brains are not yet fully formed to, to, to understand. Their reasoning is not fully formed. And most of them actually end up being addicted to things that they shouldn't be addicted to. They end up being addicted to pornography. They end up addicted to, 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 to sex and all those things because these things are being exposed to them at ages before which their brains are fully formed. So I do not understand why. I do not find a rational reason why children need to date. Number four, uh, providing technology is not always a good idea. And I think I've already began to touch on this on the previous point, but research is showing that because of the rampant internet connection and devices being readily available and cheap, and parents providing devices to children of young and younger ages, children are being exposed to porn as early as age seven. And even probably earlier than that. And like I said, the brain is not fully formed for the child. And a child is not just not prepared for some of the things they're going to see on the internet. Be it violence, be it sex. So providing technology at a, at, a, at a young age without supervision. And even not limiting the amount of screen time your children are having is not good for you. It's not good for your children. And I feel like parents need to be aware that your children will not die without technology and it's okay for them to wait until they are of a good age they can use these things responsibly because otherwise children will be exposed to these things and they will end up falling into many harmful behaviors i mean linked to that set of um exposure to pornography is the the the, 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 the rampant behavior of masturbation as well and children who behave that way take the wrong ideals as they grow up into marriage. And I believe most of the people that are struggling, that are my age, that are struggling with marriage today have formed the wrong idea about sex and uh, marriage and love based on what they watched on the internet. Because if you watch pornography, the truth is the idea that is portrayed is love is like enslavement. It's like someone else is there to serve your passions and your deepest and darkest secrets. And women are treated like objects. And that is how your child will grow up. So when you provide technology to your children, you need to know that this is what you're exposing them to. So rather spend time with your children because most parents that provide these things are using them as excuses because they are not present, because they are always working. They are using these things as excuses or as, um, as indulgences to make sure that their children still love them. But I believe that children can still be okay without exposure to too much technology and too much internet. Number five is chores are good for keeping children out of trouble. And it's linked to number six, but I do wish my parents had given me more chores. I had chores, I had my fair share of chores, and now chores are a taboo in families. I mean, every family has an, a helper. If your family is well off, your bed will be made for you, your room will be swept for you, the garbage, the garden boy will take care of, the lawn will be mown by someone else. But I believe that when we give chores to our children, not only are we teaching them to be responsible adults and we're teaching them things that will develop their frontal cortex, but we are keeping them out away from that influence that is so bad for them. There's a saying that says an idle mind is the devil's playground. And when children are idle, they have nothing to do. They end up binging on TV or thinking on, and getting into all sorts of bad behaviors and bad habits. So giving children chores will not harm them. At least this is my experience. And like I said in the beginning, I'm sharing this as my own personal experience. So giving your children responsibilities around the house, allowing them to carry their own weight, will make sure that they grow up to be responsible adults. Number six, I said, is linked to uh, number five. I grew up, I was raised by a single mother. And I think if I had a father, I would have had more chores. At least if my father was a decent person and he was present. I feel like if my mother and my father had gotten married and they had raised me together, I would have had a better chance of running away from some of the evils that I was exposed to. Because my mom was a working mother. 
she had to be working she had to do the groceries everything depended on this one person and what it meant is we were exposed to so many dangers and obviously it's tiring for a parent to raise kids all by herself so two is always better than one if you can avoid having children outside of marriage i would encourage you not to because otherwise it will be difficult for you to raise children for the lord and if you you think the person you you want to have kids with is just not emotionally committed i would encourage you to hold it off because it takes a lot of work to raise children as you can see it takes a lot of responsibility actually the moment you have children your world changes forever you do not live only for yourself but you live to secure your children to provide for them and to make sure that they are happy and to make sure that they will end up in heaven one day i believe is the most important thing for christian parents so two is always better than one don't let the world fool you because they are making single parenting and romanticizing having children by yourself but especially for male children they need a male figure they need a role model so that they can grow up knowing what a proper home is supposed to be number 7 just stop playing church a lot of parents play church if i may put it plain they go to church they come back but there is nothing really that they get out of this whole church experience and most parents are part of this charismatic movement where it's all about riches and pleasure and being rich in this world but the truth is if you're taking your kids to that kind of church don't expect them to learn morality in this kind of churches that i just described also what happens is the pastor's children will be up to no good and they will be teaching your children indoctrinating them that living a christian life means not restricting your passions and not behaving in a godly manner they will be sleeping with every girl and all those things and that is why as a parent i believe it is important as much as you choose this, the, the 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 environment around which your home is based it's important for you to make sure that you go to a church where the influence is right and where the spirit of the lord is at work because if your children do not grow up knowing god they will grow up to become worldlings they will grow up not respecting god and they will have no reason to respect you as well so stop playing church stop pretending that your church is a place where morality is preached if it is not either stop being a christian altogether another thing is being a christian does not mean just going to a church a building there's a there's a quote that i like that say going to church does not make you a christian as much as parking a car in a uh, standing in the garage makes you a car if you are not praying if the christian lifestyle is not lived in your home your children will not grow in, grow up knowing god your children will learn to respect and reverence god and to worship him the right way if you as parents are doing it the right way so if you're still playing church as parents you need to know that the chances of your children going to heaven are quite low as low as your chances are probably so stop playing church treat your religion seriously read your bible and follow it and teach your children to do the same and this is the best investment you can ever make even if you don't leave a cent for them if you leave them with a the fear of the lord your children will grow up to be people that are useful and responsible in this world that will respect other people their property and will live a life that you can be proud of so stop playing church and then the final one which i believe is also quite important do not pass your responsibility of parenting to others i think human beings are the only i'm going to use this word loosely animals that allow other people to look after their children in the animal kingdom no other animal and i'm not saying people are animals let me use the other word human beings are only the only species that give the responsibility of looking after their young to other people and there might be other animals but it's not the majority right so when you leave the responsibility of your children with other people you need to know that anything that happens the truth is it falls to you if your children are molested by your family members that you trust with your children it's your fault because those are your children if um you leave your children at a crash and you are not sure of the place and you you have not done your research actually i believe if you can avoid it take care of your own children 
if you can avoid it and you can afford to because you will not be able to answer for some of the things that will have happened to your children in other people's care. And when you stand before God on that day and you have to answer, you will realize that the money that you were chasing and the success you were pursuing just isn't worth it anymore when your children are lost because someone has not done as good a job as you would have wished, even if you were paying them money. I, for one, believe that raising children is one of the most important things that we are uh, entrusted with as human, human beings, and we need to take that job seriously. So if you can, do the job yourself. Do not leave your children to live with your family members. There's a, a tendency amongst my peers also to have children and send them off to go live with their parents. And people make excuses, but whatever happens to that child, the first person in line to account to God is you. So make sure you take care of your own children if you can. And I'm not judging anyone who cannot. I do understand that there are situations and settings when it's just impossible. So these are my eight uh, lessons that I drew from this whole reflection of going back and seeing my childhood friends and thinking about how I grew up and how if I could choose for myself the ideal situation in which to be raised, I would choose these eight things. I would choose to live with my mom from the day I'm born to the day I am a fully responsible adult. I will choose to go to a proper church where I will be taught from the Bible. I will choose all the things that I've spoken about. And I believe that this is this would have prevented me from going into the world and experiencing the world for myself. I would have actually grown up to be a young godly man who loved and feared God without having to first taste the world for myself. I hope this is helpful to someone. And like I said, I'm not judging anyone. I'm sharing my opinion. I'm sharing my experience and what I think based on what I've read from the Bible and what I see. This is my worldview. It might help someone, but someone might think it's not their cup of tea. That's okay. But I pray that it may help someone. So let us pray. Kind and loving Father, Lord, I'm so thankful that you are so caring towards us and you have given us some responsibilities that are difficult. But Lord, you never put a weight on our shoulders more than we are able to bear. So I pray, Lord, for myself as a parent and for all parents that will hear this, that you may give us wisdom and you may give us the power to do the right things. And you may take care of us and teach us the right way to raise our families for you. Because, Lord, no one would enjoy heaven when their children is lost, when their child is lost. I pray, Lord, that you may guide us and guard us and in the work, week that is starting, Lord, may you be with us and help us to not play church, but to start reading our Bibles, to start worshipping you in spirit and truth so that our children may see what a Christ-like character is from us. Because I know that what we do, our children will also copy. I pray, Lord, that you may sanctify us with your spirit and with your truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining me.